Hello, everybody. This is International Master Jesse Cry, and I'm going to do a chesslecture.com uh, video here on the adventures of the Halloween Gambit. Okay, so in the last couple of weeks, I've been looking at uh, the Kasparov's theorem of matter, of matter, of, of material, uh, time, and quality of position. And uh, I think we've been looking, the first example I thought was very pure with Morphe's game. And then the second example I thought was very difficult with the game uh, Mises Alekheim. And um, I did those. I did that last one in particular as a means to try to understand how Kasparov came to many of his own middle game decisions. And I found myself in that lecture really feeling uncomfortable. Uncomfortable um, that not only could I not understand the position fully, but in a way it was just impenetrable, it felt. It felt like there was no means to penetrate the position in some in terms of calculation, no matter how, how much I looked at it. And um, that night I had a really curious dream. I dreamt that I was playing, you know, the normal game that mortals play where we're trying to nick our opponent for a pawn or nickel and diamond and trying to win the game. And my opponent suddenly took me into this deep forest. You know, there was a bogs around me there was no clear path there was thorny things all around and i thought to myself this is very rude and that's and that's the impression i got from that game is it was a different kind of way of playing it was a different tactic uh in terms of practically playing the game and today to relieve myself from that horrible uh nightmare i thought i'd look at something a position that i consider humorous in fact, terribly funny. But I hope it has it shed some light upon how this whole uh, material time and quality of position thing plays out. And uh, because it's kind of crazy, I'm taking it to the coffee break section, or we might call it the coffee house section. Okay, so let's look at the business. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Knight C3, Knight F6. This is called the Four Knights, also known as the most boring position in the world because it's very hard for White to get an advantage here. Though clearly White has to have some kind of advantage because he's up at tempo and it's a symmetrical position. Okay, so I'd like to take a look at what's called the Halloween Gambit. Now, I don't actually think this is theoretically a fantastic move, but I think it w does help under us understand maybe these questions of material time and quality of position. So let's take a look. Knight takes e5. I think it's a humorous coffee house move. Um, and it's actually surprisingly difficult for black to outright refute. And I don't I actually don't think it's possible to refute this thing outright. Let's just take a, a look at the position. Now, one thing that we'd have to understand from a practical standpoint is that it's definitely dangerous for white to play because black has so many different ways to respond to this uh, way of playing. He can give back the piece immediately. He can bring the knight to c6. He can go to g6. And then even after that, there's just a whole web of complications in a way similar to the uh, mises Alekhine game. So let's just take a look at some variations. I don't want... To, what I want to try to do is just give a taste of how this opening works and to try to show um, or a way of maybe thinking about this position. So let's just take a look at one simple variation where everything looks fairly natural so far. Okay, so let's apply this little equation business. So in terms of material, we have a pawn for a knight, so we're like, you know, we're like two pawns down in terms of the material. Now, in terms of tempo, I guess I would say we're two, um, we're two tempo up. We have the bishop move. Obviously, we have two pieces developed. Black has one, and Black has owes us basically one more move. He needs to move his d pawn at some point to free his bishop. So there, that's not much. Though usually, like in the old Russian school, they would say if you're going to sacrifice a pawn, you should get three tempo for it. And here we've sacrificed a piece for a pawn, and we only have two tempo for it. 
And so if we were to say that white has compensation here, we'd have to ascribe it to some kind of quality of position. And to me, this position is funny because the first time I looked at it, I thought this is just ridiculous um, to give away a piece like this. But then the more I looked at it, it seemed to me that even though this white might not be the most correct way of playing, that white definitely has strong compensation, especially because he has strong uh, control of the center. Though from a position of like classical chess understanding, how people have thought about this game, particularly during the Russian school, this would be well, unthinkable to play like this as white. It's ridiculous. So well, let me show one variation. One variation where I, find, I realized that it, things weren't that simple was the most outright attempt for black to try to refute white, and that was d6 trying to undermine white's center e5 pawn, queen f3, bishop e6, queen takes b7. Well, now it's absolutely not clear what's happening, because now after bishop takes c4, queen c6, the queen can't go, go to d7 because the rook on a8 would ha be hanging, and so the king has to make some horrible move like king e7 and queen takes e4, and now we clearly have incredible compensation because the king will permanently be on the run, and all of black's pieces are miserable. So just a very few basic moves and natural moves, and black found himself in trouble. Okay, let's go back a couple moves. So I just want to relate a, a quick story uh, or a game that happened in this variation. And um, I have a student who's very young and, and currently rated only about... 850. His name's Asa, and uh, he's in about he's in sixth grade, I think. And I showed him this, and he was very eager to try it out. And he, in this game, is playing a 2100 player, who's probably even stronger than that, maybe 2200 in terms of his understanding. And so the 20, he makes a very natural move. Black does. He plays bishop b4. Again, black can play so many different moves here. It's just incredible, and that's why. What's interesting is if White's going to play like this, White really has to have an abstract conception of the position. He has to think, okay, I have the center, I'm up to tempo, and Black's pieces are discoordinated. Okay, he played a natural move, Queen F3. We have to stop pawn to D5. Okay, so the 2100 played a very natural move, Queen E7. Oh, well, again, White plays natural, castles. And now we're threatening Knight to D5, which would be uncomfortable. So, black took the knight. And now, uh, the 2100 made a very uh, human positional move, which turned out to be a disastrous mistake. But you can see his motivations. He wants to develop quickly, and so he just tries to give back the pawn immediately. Um, in my estimation, it seems like knight h6 would have been a little bit better, but it's clear White is always going to have some kind of enduring compensation. Okay, d5, bishop takes. And now black made a mistake and played c6. Okay, now here my friend, my young friend could have played bishop takes c6, and the game would have been basically over, because the rook on a8 will fall if the bishop is taken. But white didn't play that. And the reason I'm going to show you the rest still a couple more moves is because kind of a, this the only mention I think this has in a book that I know of uh, they always the, the claim has always been that if we go back several moves here that in this position black should play d5 giving back the pawn immediately. And it was thought that White simply busted at that point. But I think we'll see in the game we have a very similar position to this d5 push that we'll get um, that we get in the game be between my young friend rated 850 and the 2100. Okay, so let's go. Let's see. Bishop c4, Bishop b4, Queen f3, Queen e7, castles takes takes d5 takes c6. Okay, so he plays bishop b3. And it's very interesting that, that this position really 
black's only move to really develop is knight h6. Okay, my young student immediately took. And then he just tried to win a pawn. Very natural. Probably the best move as well. Again, I think the 2100, in a way, he played a very human and natural move. Castles. Queen takes pawn. Queen h4. And it's very curious because here in this position, both sides have played very natural moves. And what's interesting is that white's advantage in terms of the discoordination of black's pieces, that's basically completely evaporated. Black's pieces are now coordinated. Um, and the tempo advantage, that's also evaporated. On the other hand, what's happened, though, is that those two advantages of white have been converted into now three pawns for a piece. And so it's almost like the energy involved in the discoordination and uh, the tempo has been converted into a material advantage. And that's one of the things I think we can deal with on a more serious level in other lectures where we take positions that are classical positions that are normally seen uh, in master play. But still, this fun position, I think we can realize white has full compensation. And in fact, my young student went on to get a winning position. And his, posi his pieces are actually easier to play here because he can, in particular, try to dream of pushing his f-pawn all the way to f5. Or, given depending on how black plays, he can dream about pushing the d-pawn to d5. So this is just a fun thing, I think, but hopefully also an instructive little opening. I like the whole name of the Halloween Gambit because it reminded me of in my dream of how I was horrified at the way my opponent was taking me into this dark forest where I really just wanted to play very simple chess, and now all of a sudden it became very complicated. Um, if you're interested in more about the Halloween Gambit, I'd really refer you to an excellent uh, website written by a Dutch gentleman named Krabbe, K-R-A-B-B-E. And while you're there, I'd truly recommend checking out his short story called Master Jakobsen, a beautiful uh, short chess story. And uh, that might be a pleasurable coffee break all in itself. So this is uh, International Master Jesse Cry, and I hope you've enjoyed 